Well, hello, 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 everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Spotlight. Bet you thought we disappeared. We haven't been doing this quite as often as we had been before, but that's because we've got some other stuff that is really taking off, and we've been focusing there. So if you enjoy The Spotlight, please leave us some likes, leave us some hearts, let us know that we're missed, and we'll make sure that we come back more often. Awesome. So today I would really love to introduce you to a gentleman that I met probably about a couple years ago in um, one of the many um, business type development groups online that I have been a part of over the last few years. And um, this gentleman has really stolen my heart with his authenticity, his generosity, and his interesting take on how it how the process of finding love so please help me welcome mr alan watts he's a very creative relationship coach at loveengineers.win thank you so much for joining me today alan how are you i'm very good thank you girl thank you for having me here absolutely it's been my excited pleasure to try and get you on the show get our 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 schedules to align where in the world are you right now right now um i'm in england you may be able to tell from the accent but um <laughs> you don't take that with you when you come to america there's some other guy that uh, that's from my town that uh, one or two people have heard of um some guy called william shakespeare so i'm actually in uh, stratford on avon right in the middle of the country good old billy shakespeare oh my gosh how many words has that playwright added to our vocabulary right um there's yeah tangent <laughs> tangent for the word witch in me sorry about that <laughs> i just love the fact that that he actually created words that we use every day now you know that kind of thing. So, how is the weather there in Stratford upon Avon? Um, wet, cold, and um, well, if I were to look out the uh, window now, it would be pitch black. <laughs> Very dark right now. Yeah, we have such a time difference. What time is it there for you locally now? Dark in the evening. So awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. Well, let's begin by um, you know kind of going back a little bit into what actually created this inspired idea on your behalf um what exactly is a love engineer and and what made you walk start walking down this particular path in relationship coaching you know that's a great question um in a way there's uh, lots of questions within one and lots of different answers so the actual name of the love engineer came not long after I'd um, done my first co coaching qualification. I was on a spiritual retreat and the one day, one of the, the um, facilitators says, well, what do you do? And I thought, well, do I tell them my former career or do I tell them the direction that I'm going now? So I said, well, for the last quarter of a century, I've been a truck mechanic and now I'm um, becoming a relationship coach. He sat there and paused for a minute and said, like, what have I said? What have I done? And all these crazy thing, things going through your head or my head. And uh, he just sat there and says, ah, from truck mechanic to love mechanic. I like it. <laughs> that's awesome. That, yeah, thought that's really good. Um, I think I'm more of an engineer than a mechanic with a coach inside. So, um, then the love engineer was born. As I for why coaching, go ahead. It's um, mainly because of my own journey through life and a lot of um, failed relationships or learning experiences that were also known as relationships, shall we say? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, my. In my early days, shall we say, I was the uh, that nice guy. You know, the one you go to open up to, share the world's darkest secret with him, and you know you wouldn't tell anybody. You'd never date him, but you know he was safe. Well, I was that guy. 
And I used to get really frustrated with these amazing girls that have come up to me, talk to me, give me, tell me all this stuff. And they'd get their hearts broken by some bad boy. And then um, I'd pick them up, dust them off again. And then they still wouldn't date me. And then we'd go, go off to another bad boy. And the cycle kept repeating. I just thought it was nuts. <laughs> so, um, rather challenging journey through dating. And um, I ended up uh, going traveling to run away, well, to try and escape some of my problems or running away, really. And while I was away, I found that all of the things that I was trying to run away from even though it's the opposite side of the world in Australia. Every single one was there too. Initially, I'm like, this is nuts. And then I realized I took me and myself with me. Isn't that, uh, yeah, we do yeah. that, don't we? We do indeed. And then while I'm there, I think, okay, if I want to get a really nice girl, what's it going to take? And I had this belief in mind from the movies and all this other stuff that you kind of hear about. And you sort of think, look at yourself, looked at myself as I was, and it's like, okay, what's the difference between me and that guy over there? Ah, he's got money. <sighs> How wrong was that idea? Anyways, <laughs> so there's this book. I was happened to be in a bookshop one day, and there was this... Uh, book on the shelf called retire young retire rich from robert kiyosaki so i thought i'll have some of that so i bought it so, and it inspired me a little bit so i went back and bought rich dad poor dad and then the cash flow quadrant and loads of other books and because i'm traveling around with a backpack i was sort of reading these things posting them back to england <laughs> used to look a bit crazy but easier to just give them away to somebody but um Oh, if they're worth yeah. keeping, they're worth keeping. I, as you can see behind me, I, I'm a bibliophile myself. It's hard for me to let go of a good book. Indeed. So that year in Australia was actually a big, um, big lesson of growth for me, as it was. But it also opened my eyes up to what it was like, life was like without my close friends and also my family. So... But I enjoy the country so much. Like, okay, why don't I stay here? Spoke to the immigration lot, and they, and they said, "Well, you can stay. Just forget the rest of your travels." I'm like, nah. <laughs> Got six months to go, mate. <laughs> so um, he said, "Well, I'll tell you what. Go and sit on the beach with a piece of A4 paper. Draw a line down the middle. Reasons to be in England one side. Reasons to be in Australia in the other." That makes sense. So I went and did it. And it had a massive long list for being in Australia and three for England. England won. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Now, why would, why would the short list win on that one? Um, friends, family, they were two big things. And the other one is they have something in Australia that we don't have over here, which is a lot of deadly snakes. Ah, friends, family, no, and no I, snakes. <laughs> well, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, especially if you're sort of working in a garage or something, you can't just go and pick up a piece of tin you need. You've got to make sure there's no snake hiding underneath it first. Like, yeah. Nah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd go with you. I, I would take London drizzle over poisonous snakes probably myself. I can't, I can't really slight you for that. <laughs> So, yeah, with, I, when I came back, I had a clear vision. I had dreams. I had goals. I had plans of action. And 18 months later, none of that had happened. Yet I had got married, bought a house. It's like, hang on a minute. This is nuts. So I set up my own business and I'm part-time because... I'd always had that entrepreneurial spirit from when I was about 12. And um, I started with what I know. So as I was a mechanic, started fixing cars outside of work. And 
after a few months, I'd got two clients. And one was fast. I hope you were charging an awful lot to get you through two months between clients. <laughs> nope. I was anywhere near it. But luckily, that was outside of a full time job. So, and then I got the opportunity to go and see a cabaret act called Iron Maiden, which I'd seen before, but um, I actually won these two tickets on a, a radio station. Hmm. And all my mates are going in anyway, so I've got the spare ticket. And my guitar teacher says, I'll sell that for you. Cool. So he sold it for me, and I agreed to give the uh, the guy who bought the ticket a lift down to London. While we were there, he says, um, have you ever seen these guys before? I said, yeah, loads of times since the first Monsters of Rock thing I saw them at in 1992, I think it was. He just looked at me and smiled and says, I was only two then. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, you cheeky little. <laughs> but then that also made me start look, going into myself and saying, okay, what happened to all these uh, dreams and goals that I had when I came back from Australia? Even more so when later on that night, they play a song called Wasted Years. <laughs> Uh, wow, well, if that isn't uh, the universe coming around to poke you in the eye. Absolutely. So uh, <laughs> that was on a Saturday night. On the Monday morning, first phone call, call I made was to my first client, or first or second, which just happened to be a business coach. I said, we need to talk. <laughs> Beautiful. And with the coach, it, um, the business grew from pretty much 50 pounds in my back pocket to turning over nearly double what I was earning as a full-time employee. That's see now that that's a good coach. Now, maybe you can help me out with this. What's the difference between a coach and a mentor? That's a great question. Okay. So this is my perspective on it. And I have a few other coaching buddies that, um, that think along the same lines. And a coach is about getting the best out of the client. It's about getting the goals out of the client. It's about getting their ultimate motivation and their ultimate dreams and why they want to do it and really getting all the information out of them and then working on strategy to achieve it. Mm -hmm. Whereas a mentor is... It's kind of more like a teacher. You go along and say, I'm here. I want to be here. Tell me what to do. And the mentor will then say, well, look, this is what's worked for me in the past. Not necessarily what's right for the client. Nice. Even though so the mentor gives advice, and it's up to you to whether you follow it or not. <laughs> The coach yep. gives you assignments, and if you don't do them, don't expect to get the results. Very much so. And the, co the coach and coach is um, a lot more of a team, I feel. I like that. I like that. So um... it's with, with a mentor, mm -hmm. go ahead. it's not in off his nose if the mentee doesn't do what they're told. Whereas with a coach... If the coachee doesn't get the result, neither does the coach. Makes perfect sense. And, and yeah, that's the coach's reputation if the, the coachee does not get the results. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what other kind of relationship challenges have you personally overcome that give you the authority to coach people in building relationships that they want to have? So are you familiar with the uh, the old empath narcissist kind of uh, relationship? Personally, yes. <laughs> I've had one of those. Um, my marriage, shall we say, was a lovely lady. We we just were not a match and not an alignment. So partly due to where I was at mentally and emotionally when we got married and the joys of online dating at the time, which was still kind of new. Mm -hmm. I married a lady from another country. 
which is fine. She was studying in Europe, so it's relatively easy. But for her to come and live in the UK or spend more time here, for us to really get to know each other, because of the visa laws, the only real option would have been a fiancé visa. Cool. But there's a clause with that. You've got to get married within six months. Which doesn't give you a lot of time to get to know each other. Yeah, that would make sense. Especially when I'm working nights. Ooh, that makes it darn near impossible. Yeah. So after 18 months, I came off nights onto days with a different job and about a 10 grand a year pay reduction. It's like, okay, if this is going to work, we need to spend time with each other. We need to get to know each other. There's also this thing in the back of my mind, well, is she just after a passport? Which a lot of my mates did as well. So... I think it was about two to three years after we were married. She's got the passport. She's still there. Okay. Maybe that's not it then. And um, maybe there could be more to it. And although I picked up little bits here and there that I didn't like, it's like only little things. So I didn't bother sort of saying too much. And that old saying, you know, happy wife, happy life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it will all be good. Not quite. So within that, I'd also um, stop playing hockey. So I don't, and stop playing guitar because she didn't like the noise, stop li listening to the music. That, so all these three things that I'd used for years for releasing lower vibration emotions, mm -hmm. I'm not, I've got another other way for release them. So they build up and build up and build up. So I'm getting to be a mess inside. Plus at the same time, her mother died, which was uh, a little challenging, but she was also working away from home, which was a bit weird. It's like, why come to another country to marry a man, spend your life with him to go and work away? And she come home be being paid cash in hand as a waitress. It's like, hang on a minute. This just doesn't quite make sense. And the one year she um, she was over in China and and I found a lot of things I didn't like, although I was looking for something completely different, like um, a diary in her own language. I couldn't read most of it. So but I could read car registration numbers, hotel locations, prices, men's names, I think, don't like that. <laughs> I really don't like that. Mm -hmm. but I was like, I don't want to rock the boat in case it's just nothing. So I've got it all translated and it's just like the whole world comes crashing down. And then uh, she came back from visiting her family. We had a bit of a uh, set to and found out some other stuff which I liked even less and then it's like okay there's a big part of me that just wants to say bye bye go away get out of my life I want a woman I can trust mm -hmm. and then it's like I've got this sort of Damocles hanging over my head because mm -hmm. I think it was um, a couple of years before when we were over in um, in her country out in Asia well, let me let me bring you around to how did you actually overcome being taken for a ride by a narcissistic person who was mining you for your stability and security and access to your citizenship? I mean, that's a kind of a big thing there. And I mean, it's bigger than most people are dealing with. And you were able to do that. What what was what were the actions that you took that put an end to her gravy train? Um. In a way, I did nothing. Mm -hmm. So 18 months later from that point, we got two kids, twins, um, not necessarily by my choice, but um, there we were. And the one day 
I went out to work and my neighbours came, Oi, we need to talk. I'm like, what have I done? Not you. Are you aware that she's going out shopping and leaving the kids home alone? I'm like, no. So um, I went back in the house and said, look, that stops. End of, never do it again. Because social services, if they find out, they will come and take the kids away. Mm -hmm. Now, these are the twins at the time are four months old. Oh, my. Yeah, oh so my. it does make you wonder what is going on in there. Mm-hmm. And then six weeks later, I came home to an empty house, which was a really big shock because I didn't see that one coming. Mm-hmm. So it's like, okay, life goes on. I'll just take one step at a time, one day at a time do my best to get access to the kids and all that kind of thing. And then had another relationship. It's like, oh, okay, I could fall off a cliff and land off cushions. And then when that one ended, it just, I just hit the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I was living in a house I couldn't afford to live in. I couldn't afford to sell it and I couldn't afford to rent it out. Not a lot of furniture in it. So one day I put some music on without really thinking about what what it was and it was actually two cds i picked up while i was in um, australia gifted to me by the singer nice and on one cd it's a song called um you, you can't take your, away my rock and roll so it's like you take my house you can take my money you can take my fancy cars but you can't take my rock and roll and that really hit me so i put in his other cd and then there's a track on there that's like um, going on, like saying, is this kid better off now that his father is dead because his mo mother was never what a mother should be? And that hit me so hard. And it's like, it's almost as if he's singing about me and my son in 20 years' time. Mm -hmm. But it hit me at that moment. And I'm like, I was actually that close to selling everything I've got cutting my losses and moving out to New Zealand. And it's like, I can't. Those kids deserve better than that. So from that point, within two weeks, I hired a coach. <laughs> Good for you. That, that's the action you took that finally put an end uh, to that stuff. And what did the coach have you doing? Uh, actually going inside myself. And it's like, is that true? It's like, and she did all this stuff. Well, that really sucks. Now, what what the, did you do to uh, contribute to the situation? And initially, I'm like, nothing, nothing. Yeah, okay, she did. did got away with it because I let her do it, and I ignored everything al along the way and uh, all these other things. And, mm -hmm. and the one thing I ignored was that thing just before we got married that says, I don't think this is right. Little voice in your head. Little voice coming from somewhere. <laughs> and then there's another voice that says, you pay for the bloody church. All the guests are here. <laughs> it's all paid for. You're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that it's, it's interesting because that financial investment, right, um, can work for us or against us right? Yeah. It's the thing that has us keep going when we're you know, like, for example, in a coaching environment, and we're like, I'm not liking what I have been told. It's too much truth. It's too raw. I don't like this person anymore. But I've paid them all the money. So ugh, suck it up and do it. And it makes it so hard to hear that other little intuitive voice going, don't do it. It's a trap. Don't do it. It's a trap but I've paid all this, forget the money, it's a trap, <laughs> you know? So you you went through with it, now you're in the coaching, you're, you're, you're taking some personal responsibility for it, and then what happens? And then, so step by step, um, also went to Anthony Robbins' uh, Unleash the Power Within, and as a result of that, I got a peer group, 
which was uh, use well actually had two peer groups one was uh, like a yes group there's a monthly meeting in one of the local cities and one that's an online facebook group and there was like people in there from all over the world and within that group just opening up and letting all this other stuff out as well and actually it's like maybe sharing some things isn't that bad after all all these things you get told growing up like don't show emotions and um that's still work in progress by the way and i imagine so for an englishman uh, forgive the stereotype uh, but you are a stiff yeah. upper lip society british stiff upper lip <laughs> and the uh, man up thing and all this bs really it's like actually sort of look back and you think everything i was is everything i'd been told to be question is who am i mm. and in that group I, over time i ended up being one of the ones that was helping new members and people say oh you should be a coach you should be a coach and i look through my facebook friends list and it goes coach 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 <laughs> no point so and I had a interesting uh, connection with a young lady and it's like I sat in that moment it's like what the heck do I do now if I got some coaching skills I could handle this very very differently so it's like okay when next time I was at my peer group I'm like hey Tony train me as a coach very nice. I thought wasn't worth it. Yeah, I've kind of got a reason now. <laughs> Very cool. Now, can you give us an example of um, one of the people that you've worked with since becoming a relationship coach and what kind of difference that you made with them? Yeah, I can think of just a lady about 80 months ago. She was having anxiety all over the place. She'd recently come out of a divorce herself and her husband had been cheating on her. They'd got one son, one child between them and she wanted more. And he's like, no way, I'm not having any more. And then he went and had one with her best friend and they were living across the road from their house at the same time. So it's like she got out of there, moved out. and But it was still all that stuff mm -hmm. in there. So now, even with a lot, in the first lockdown, she chose to take voluntary redundancy after a job she'd been in for 15 years. Wow. Okay. And setting up her own business in a relationship with a man that's completely opposite. Okay. Very nice. And she's happier now. She's enjoying her life more now. Very much so, although this latest lockdown, I think it's been having a little bit of an impact as with many other people around the world, unfortunately. Yeah. Making yeah. that social connection. That Absolutely. It's been, you know, we don't think about it much, but especially when you're not already in a committed monogamous relationship where you're living in the same place, right? Before all these COVID lockdown situations popped up, right? Yeah. And you're you're dating or you're maintaining two separate households. It it really impacted relationships in a way that we don't normally think of because you all we all tend to think the entire world has our worldview, our kind of relationship. Everybody I know is married. Well, no, they're not. <laughs> you know, everybody I know is dating and none of us can go to the bar. Well, no, that's not across the board either. And people have had to pivot and match their relationship style to these lockdowns. So what kind of what kind of issues are you seeing for people in these COVID times that maybe are a little bit different than what you've had to deal with before with your clients? A lot of it comes down to communication and space because where you've got two parties where most of the time 
either one or both would be out at work for sort of 40, 40 odd hours a week. And the kids would be at school. And then all of a sudden, both parents are locked in at home <laughs> and the kids. They've not only got to work from home, they've also got to be a school teacher as well. Mm-hmm. Try and get the kids to behave as well as all the other housework and all the other stuff. And sometimes, some bit, you just have to let it go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want like, to... What important now? That's excellent perspective it sounds like it would have a very healing um impact on wherever a relationship is at right now like these are not normal times and and you know sometimes you just gotta flow with it even if it's not the way that you think it's supposed to look right now it it, just like the planets do it just it'll come back around (laughs) right well, we are running out of time, so I want to make sure that I uh, let all of our audience know what you are offering, because this is really actually pretty huge. Um, it's not ungenerous. It's very generous. And it, as I understand it, you are offering three separate people each a relationship coaching com- you know, conversation with you, a consultation sometime between now and and Christmas Eve, and all they have to do is reach out to you on your Facebook page, slide into your messenger, and say, hey, I want that. I want that one. Let's let's schedule a talk. Absolutely. Co- correct? So give me an idea of what they can expect to receive from you during that call. Well, everything I do for my clients is totally bespoke to where they are. Because, and the reason for that is, Every single person in the world has a different view of what success is. Everyone has a different view of what love is. So success and love is going to be different for every single person. And every single person, whether it's a single or a couple, is going to be in a different place when they reach out. Nice. So it's not going to be a case of fix everything in one go. It's okay. What's your biggest challenge right now? Let's handle it. Beautiful. And you know, enough of that, what's the challenge? Let's handle it over and over, rinse and repeat. We'll fix everything in the long haul, huh? Absolutely. So if if they're satisfied with what they get you from that call, then you do have one-on-one coaching programs that they can enroll in or schedule with you? I do, yes. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. All right, my dear, thank you so much for being with me today. And your, I just love what you do. Uh, as we've gotten closer to each other over the last couple of years, and you actually stopped in and visited with me at one point, that was fun. Um, you and Karen, and, and that was a, a great afternoon. Um, I invite my audience, please reach out to Alan. He's got a very comforting, authentic being about him that makes it easy for you to admit the things, even your own part of it, or um, the, the down and dirty parts that we don't normally show the public in relationships. Um, and he's got the wisdom to help you individually deal with your personal challenges that maybe no one else are are experiencing quite specifically like you do so please reach out to alan alan thank you so much for what you do in the world do you have any final thoughts for our audience before we send them on their way today yes um one question to ask yourself because especially with all these lockdowns and things and it's It doesn't take much for energies to rise and tempers to rise and all that kind of thing. And when you've, there's a bit of a disconnect between you and your partner. I self question, what's my outcome here? Do I want to connect or do I want to fight? Do I want to be happy 
or do I want to be right? Because if you want to connect and you want to be happy, you're going to be coming from your heart. If you want to be right and you want to fight, you're going to be coming from your ego. Beautiful. That is... Great example I use for my clients for the difference between the two. We have Mr. Ego. <laughs> Darth Vader. <laughs> and when you're following your heart and soul. I love it. I Little love voice. It, Yoda. Big one that can be quite manipulative. Makes sense. Again, thank you so much for sharing your time with us and for what you provide to the world. Um, I'll be talking to you again real soon. Take care. Bye for now. When you open yourself up to actual energy work, makes that recovery progress so much faster. That recovery is possible. You do not have to live as a victim until your last days. You have unbelievable strength, and I know that because you're still here. Do you want to create something completely unrecognizable with your life? I can show you how.